Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone to the third part of cell biology. We are going to cover a few other cell organ, organelles uh, in this topic and that is cell walls, how do cells move, what are the different organelles that they use for movement and other uh, cell organelles. So let us start with the most important part of the bacterial cell or the prokaryotic cell and that is the cell wall. So we know that for living um, as independent organisms, the first thing that allows them to live independently is the cell wall. So all prokaryotes have a rigid cell wall. So these cell walls, like I said, are rigid outer layers of the cell and they have several functions to perform. You have already seen in the previous topic that the plasma membrane which is uh, basically the site which determines how nutrients go in and out of the solution, how waste is excreted, that is a very fragile uh, inner and it's an inner membrane and it's highly fluid and it's not bonded at all. So it's very easy to disturb it. It's an extremely fragile membrane. Okay. So without the cell wall to protect it, this membrane cannot exist. Okay. And the membrane, the plasma membrane is the one that does all the useful work of uh, determining what goes in and out. So the first thing is protection for the plasma membrane. That is the first function of the cell wall. The second is to maintain the water pressure at the level that is required for the cell to function. So it prevents the cell from rupturing if the water pressure inside the cell becomes higher than the outside pressure. So that equilibrium is maintained by the cell wall. As I said, it's a rigid uh, membrane and the cell wall itself is a rigid membrane unlike the plasma membrane. It gives shape to the cell and it provides an anchorage point for the flagella. And uh, last but not the least, the cell wall has been found to uh, determine whether a particular disease, whether a particular infectious agent, microorganism um, will cause a disease or not. So from a clinical standpoint, some diseases are associated with the cell wall of that organism. And in many cases, it's the cell wall that determines the antibiotic sensitivity of that bacteria or prokaryote. I can also mention over here something that um, has been mentioned in some textbooks that it's only the modern bacteria that are pathogenic to us. Archaeobacteria have never been found to be pathogenic to human beings and that itself is an interesting observation. Again, it has something to do with the evolution of life and so on. So remember that a pathogen uh, likes the same conditions under which its host uh, as the um, host which means that the infected person or organism has to have the same environmental conditions as the pathogenic organism. So these modern bacteria and human beings have had a long association and it's the archaeobacteria which have no association with human beings. Then we come to cell wall composition. This cell wall has different chemical composition in different bacterial uh, groups or species. So that's another marker for differentiating different types of bacteria. Uh, what is common to all these modern bacteria is that all bacterial cell walls contain a chemical called peptidoglycan. So this peptidoglycan has two parts to it. 
the glycan part if you remember in cell chemistry in the previous topic we looked at uh, NAG and NAM so N acetyl glucosamine and M acetyl muramic acid are the building blocks of the cell wall so these are disaccharides that form the glycan part of it and these uh, building blocks they form strands and these strands are linked cross linked to each other by a polypeptide interbridges so some interbridges are shorter and others are longer and that gives identity to the bacterial species so i would ask you to look into the textbook and look at the de uh, detailed diagrams of the peptidoglycan uh, wall that is uh, there in different bacterial species so gram negative gram positive bacteria have different uh, levels of peptidoglycan in their cell wall and the structure is different based on these polypeptide interbridges but the building blocks are the same NAG NAM so um, as I said I think at some point in the past um, there are two major categories of the modern bacteria so that is gram positive and gram negative and these uh, you can see how these gram positive and gram negative bacteria are differentiated there is a gram staining procedure which we will look at in the next topic on microscopy because when you want to look at a mixed population of bacteria the first thing that most people would do is to put it through a gram staining procedure and in the gram staining procedure you will have two outcomes some cells will be colored a dark purple and other cells will be found to be pinkish or reddish in color and this color the difference in color between two groups of bacteria that is mainly because of the difference in composition of the gram positive and gram negative cells in the gram positive cells it's very simple the cell wall is very simple there is a plasma membrane around the cytoplasm which is followed by a peptidoglycan layer this peptidoglycan layer is extremely thick in gram positive cells in gram negative cells you have a plasma membrane and then you have three different layers around the plasma membrane there is an inner uh, plasma so the first thing is the inner plasma membrane that is followed by a very thin peptidoglycan layer and this thin peptidoglycan layer is followed by an outer plasma membrane so there are two plasma membranes an inner membrane and an outer membrane and outside all of this is what is called a lipopolysaccharide layer so this is kind of like a slime layer it's also called an ex uh, exopolysaccharide layer EPS or LPS uh, so that's the difference between gram positive and gram negative cell walls so when the when all the cells in a mixed population are subjected to the same staining procedure there are several steps in that procedure we will go into the details under microscopy but for now it's important for you to know that the first stain is crystal violet crystal violet gives a purple color to all the bacteria then it is decolorized by alcohol and then counter stained by saffronin saffronin has a red color now the uh, cells that have a thin peptidoglycan layer are unable to hold on to the crystal violet stain so they get decolorized by alcohol and then when saffronin is added they turn red that's the counter stain the other gram positive cells have a thick peptidoglycan layer so when they get um, when they are stained by crystal violet they retain that stain and when alcohol is applied they do not get decolorized and when the saffronin is added they remain purple so purple is a darker color it keeps the the color remains the same so here we have staphylococcus aureus it's gram positive it's purple and we have ear E. coli or Escherichia coli which is gram negative and it's pink in color so these are the this is one of the oldest uh, staining procedures perhaps uh, that we know of that has been used and it continues to be used even today to differentiate bacteria 
that into two groups based on the nature of the cell wall. So here we have uh, the characteristics of gram positive and gram negative bacteria. The morphology may be cocci or spore forming rods, they are non spore forming rods in the gram negative group. The outer membrane is absent in gram positive bacteria, it is present in gram negative uh, bacteria. The peptidoglycan layer is thick, it is multi layered. In gram negative, it is thin, it is single layered. Periplasmic space is absent. Let me show you some more uh, diagrams. So, the plasma membrane is common to all bacteria. It is there in archaeobacteria, it is there in bacteria and it is there in gram positive, gram negative. All of them have a plasma membrane. It is the outer layer, the layer outside the plasma membrane which has differences. The gram positive cells have a thick peptidoglycan layer and the gram negative cells have this thin peptidoglycan layer which is actually a monolayer and there are spaces between the plasma membrane and the peptidoglycan layer you have periplasmic space and there is an outer layer an outer membrane which is again formed by phospholipid uh, there is a bilayer which is formed by phospholipids again and you have other transmembrane proteins including the porins which will determine what comes in to the periplasmic space and then the pl uh, plasma membrane. So, and outside this you have a lipopolysaccharide layer. So, this is all about gram negative cells. In gram positive cells, after the thick peptidoglycan layer, you also have what are called tecoic acids. These tecoic acids further have glycocalyx or capsule or slime layer and this slime layer allows these bacteria to stick to surfaces. So, these are some of the things that are common to prokaryotes, the U bacteria, not the, the only thing common between uh, bacteria and archaeobacteria is the plasma membrane, the rest of it is all different. So, these tecoic acids are present in gram positive but not in gram negative are toxins produced by these bacteria. Uh, gram positive bacteria exude exotoxins. So, exotoxins is what is extruded by the cell and endotoxins and exotoxins are generated by gram negative bacteria and many of them are pathogenic. Flagellar structure is different in uh, gram positive and gram negative bacteria. I have already mentioned the gram stain. I have also mentioned that lipopolysaccharide is absent in gram uh, positive bacteria and present in gram negative. There are several other differences between lipids, lipoproteins, lysozyme, their resistance to physical disruption, the inhibition by dyes and the resistance to drying. You, you can see that because of the nature of the peptidoglycan layer, all these differences are a consequence of that difference. In terms of the cell wall of eukaryotes, so putting the prokaryotes aside, we have to remember that there are other um, microorganisms that are not bacteria. So, let us take a look at the eukaryotes. Animal cells we know do not have cell walls. Algal and plant cells have rigid cell walls of different chemical composition. This is um, in general algal and plant cells have a matrix of cellulose fibers. So, just like clothes, uh, you can see that in clothes you have a warp and a weft, but nature does not do that. It just places fibers in alternate layers. So, you can see very similar uh, structure to clothes where you have woven clothes, but not exactly the same. So, you have these fibers that are sitting on top of each other. Um, and cellulose is yeah, very similar to what we have in cotton, yes. Uh, so, we have uh, these alternating fi fibers which are made out of cellulose and they are seated on each other in alternate uh, arrangement. So, it is a matrix of cellulosic fibers. This cellulose we know is a linear strand of glucose only and it is a beta 1 for glycosidic bonds. Then we have hemicellulose. So, hemicellulose is branched. It has glucose and other sh uh, sugars and perhaps other bonds. You also have pectins. Pectins are highly hydrated. They have a gel-like consistency. 
you can have calcium carbonate in a particular organism called foraminifera and you have diatoms and dinoflagellates these are all types of algae and they have um, their shells are made out of silicate then we come to the fact that the cell walls of eukaryotes are freely permeable to water ions gases and nutrients that's how these organisms are able to survive in their environment so that's very different from the prokaryotes uh, plant cells are able to allow um, large molecules even up to 15,000 molecular weight so even large molecules which have uh, any size less than 15,000 molecular weight can permeate through these plant cell walls that's how plant cells are able to absorb nutrients from their environment through the root zone and then we come to fungal cells fungal cells have a combination of non-cellulosic and cellulosic structures in their cell walls so we have chitin chitin is a polymer of nag and we have other monomers like mannans galactosan chitosan all these are monomers that can be part of the fungal cells then we have cell walls which contain star uh, i'm sorry uh, let me uh, back up here i've already shown you the structure of starch and cellulose and when we talk about cellulose remember what i said in a previous lecture i said that uh, plant cells and especially the plant structure is made out of lignocellulosic compounds so the actual rigidity of the plant its ability to stand erect and maximize um, harvesting of uh, sunlight and converting it to chemical energy and so on all of that is based on the uh, rigidity imparted by lignocellulosic structures within the cell wall so all of that is very important for uh, plants as well as algal cells and starch on the other hand is a highly biodegradable material it provides no rigidity at all it's in contrast to cellulose which part, uh, provides some level of rigidity to the structure and when much of it comes from lignin as well then we come to diatoms diatoms are uh, like i said silicate shells uh, they are a form of microalgae that have silicate shells they are found in marine environments they are found in many freshwater environments as well as soil uh, the, like i said the shells are made out of silicate and they are considered to produce 20 to 50 percent of the oxygen on the planet is attributed to this form of microalgae and uh, we use them in environmental engineering the biggest application of diatoms is in rapid sand filters that are used in water treatment plants so in many water treatment plants you will find sand and in combination with sand you will find uh, find uh, fine sand as well as diatomaceous earth so this diatomaceous earth is finer than perhaps the finest sand particles and it provides a high degree of filtration in water treatment and you can see over here several examples from wikipedia all of them and these are all uh, different types of microalgae then we come to some other cell organelles flagella cilia and motility so we have uh, like i said flagella are used for cell motility as well as cilia so these two are the cell organelles that are used by uh, several microorganisms for moving and we also have another example of pseudopodia or cytoplasmic streaming you can refer to some of the older textbooks and um, there are examples of how amoeba creates a false foot and literally streams its cytoplasm in a particular direction to ingest food so we are going to look at all these different ways of movement within microorganisms I've already mentioned that viscous forces dominate bacterial movements and large organisms like whales and human beings are dominated by inertial movement. So like I said, we know how difficult it would be for us to swim in a pool of sugar syrup or molasses and bacterial movement in water is no different. So they are going to expend a huge amount of energy in moving from one point 
to another and they generally do it in search of either nutrients or light or oxygen. So we will take a look at some of these examples. Let's start with flagella. Flagella are rigid helical proteins unlike hair which grows from the base. You know that our own hair grows from the base not from the tip. Flagella grow at the tip even though they look like hairy appendages. Let me show you. So these are this is a bacterial cell which has a flagella attached to its uh, surface to the cell wall and uh, it, unlike hair it grows at the tip and it moves through water in a propeller like corkscrew motion. So if you know how a propeller on a boat works you know that it's moving, it's uh, rotating and it pushes the boat forward in water. So it's the same principle that the flagella uses to push the bacterial cell in the water. And I'll show you some examples. The textbook has several examples, experimental evidence of how bacteria move using flagella. They are not straight, they are helical structures with a constant wavelength and that wavelength is used to define the species of a particular bacteria. So let's take a look at different types of arrangements of bacterial flagella. So we have the first one, monotrichus means one flagella at one end. So this is one flagella attached at one end. Amphitrichus means both ends. So one flagella at each end of the cell. These are for bacilli type cells. So here we have lophotrichus. Lophotrichus is a tuft of flagella at one end and that means multiple uh, flagella attached at one end and then we have peritrichus. Peritrichus means all uh, the flagella are distributed throughout the surface area of the uh, bacterial body or the cell. How does the bacteria move in water? So here we have a polar arrangement of the flagella. So here is a bacterial cell, it has only two flagella. Now these two flagella will uh, sort of braid around each other, they will form a structure and this uh, structure will move to, to and fro literally. Okay, So this is the nature of the movement of the uh, flagellar tuft and this will push the cell in a forward direction. Now if we have a peritrichus arrangement of flagella, this is the position of the flagella at, when the bacterial cell is at rest. When it moves, it will all arrange itself so that the flagella are very close to the body of the cell and they will all again move to and fro in the same dimension and that will push the cell forward. How does the cell move? Does it move in a straight line? The answer is no. Every time the cell has to move and if it has to change direction. So what I just showed you here is a run and that run is in a straight, uh, straight line uh, direction. Okay, But when it wants to change direction, how does it change direction? So the first thing it does is it comes into its resting position, it tumbles over so that it's facing a new direction and it starts the new run. So it has a run, a tumble and a run. The tumble is simply for changing direction. Okay, then we come to paramecium. Paramecium is a protozoa and it's a higher microorganism. It's still uh, free living, it's still independent, but it's much bigger than the bacteria. And it has what are called cilia. So these cilia are like small hairy appendages that are spread over the entire surface of the um, paramecium. These cilia are arranged in rows. So over the body, they are spread all over the body, but they are arranged in rows. It's almost like hair, but uh, because they are arranged in uh, orderly form, they work like oars on a boat. So if you think about the old style big boats, which had hundreds of boatmen uh, pushing it, pushing the boat or rather the ship through the water. Uh, so you have that kind of arrangement here. So each row of cilia is going to uh, move in 
uh, at the same time so you have a ciliary wave so the ciliary wave is where each row of the cilia is moving together pushing in one direction and then the next row starts doing the same thing and so on and so forth so there is a ciliary wave over the entire body of the protozoa that pushes the protozoa through the pushes the paramecium through the water it's very interesting you can take a look at the nature of these um, cilia on the surface of the uh, paramecium and then we come to pili so pili are again uh, not always present in all bacteria they may be present in certain bacteria and i said initially that uh, bacteria divide by binary fission by and large bacteria will uh, not have sexual recombination for the simple reason they divide by binary fission and the dna of the bacterial cell is replicated exactly and then it is transmitted to the two daughter cells that each bacterial cell produces so there is generally no sexual recombination however under certain conditions it has been observed that the bacteria will create an organelle called a pilus and this pilus is going to attach itself to a recipient cell so in this particular case we have a donor cell it has the initial chromosomal dna and a certain plasmid called the f plasmid it may be any type of plasmid i'll come to why that is so important now this plasmid is considered to provide antibiotic uh, resistance to this particular uh, bacteria so let us imagine a situation where different bacteria of the same species are being exposed to a particular antibiotic some of these bacteria are resistant to that antibiotic and that is because of this plasmid not because of the original dna there are some cells which are not resistant and survival requires that they also become resistant by getting this plasmid so how is that possible so this is considered to be possible because of this organelle called the pilus so when this pilus from the resistant bacteria attaches itself to the non uh, plasmid containing bacteria you get this kind of attachment the plasmid which is another smaller strand of dna which gives the bacteria its resistance to that particular antibiotic that is cut and it's transmitted to the recipient cell through this uh, because of this pilus okay and at the end of the process both the bacteria have a pilus and a plasmid and both of them have become anti uh, resistant to the antibiotic to which uh, they only one was resistant and similarly this old uh, new cell and the old cell both will continue to provide this plasmid to other bacteria in its environment giving antibiotics and uh, resistance to all the cells in their environment so even though sexual recombination does not happen this is the only way that uh, bacteria are capable of uh, transmitting or transferring some of their dna to other bacteria of the same species so these attachment pili will determine the virulence of a particular species because once it becomes resistant to a particular antibiotic they become more virulent okay so that's all of it so these are some sems scanning electron micrographs of fimbriae as well as pili and uh, these fimbriae are used for attach for the bacteria to attach themselves to surfaces so you can see these fimbriae they are also hairy appendages that allow the bacteria to attach uh, to surfaces and then the flagella are extremely long tail like structures and they are the ones that allow the bacteria to move within water and the pilus is you can see it over here the pilus is a very different type of organelle it does not resemble either the fimbriae or the flagella and it has a very different uh, nature which is used for attaching itself to bacteria of the same species
or even across species. So these are, uh, so the fimbriae and the pili are together responsible for determining the virulence of the bacteria because remember if it attaches itself to a surface and then creates a pilus then first is first step of the process is attachment and then uh, by transferring the plasmid that gives it resistance and other uh, functions then it determines the virulence of that particular bacteria. Then there are examples of the movement of bacteria. Now you can have chemotaxis, you can have phototaxis, you can have aerotaxis. So chemo means the bacterial colony will move in response to a chemical uh, concentration gradient. So the attractant may be oxygen or the repellent may be a biocide. So the entire group or uh, colony of bacteria can be found to move uh, towards the food it wants or towards an attractant like oxygen or it will move in the opposite direction towards a pesticide or a biocidal chemical. So it will move away from that. So this kind of signaling uh, is uh, has been observed in bacteria uh, depending on the environment. So uh, chemotaxis is one thing you can refer to these uh, figures. Here I have an example of phototaxis. So there are certain photosynthetic uh, pigmented bacteria which need light. So if you have them on a surface and you provide a light source, you will find that the entire colony of some of these bacteria are capable of moving towards the light source. That is one example of phototaxis. Another example that's very interesting is based on the chlorophyll. We know that chlorophyll has absorption peaks that are uh, at certain wavelengths. So it, it was found in one particular experiment that if you have a glass slide and you have it exposed to different wavelengths of the visible light spectrum, it was found that particular species were congregating literally in those wavelengths which were corresponding to the wavelengths of the bacterial chlorophyll absorption peaks. So this is these are examples of phototaxis that uh, those wavelengths or the light source are useful for the bacteria for photosynthesis. So these phototrophic bacteria were moving in response to a light gradient towards the light source. And I've already mentioned this point and then we come to phototrophic bacterial colonies moving. So there are several examples of the entire colony or even single cells moving in response to a light gradient phototaxis. I'll end this uh, part of the lecture here. Thank you.